arriving back home uh, from NASA from work for the day and I'm walking through my garage and holy smokes here is this big red shipping container with white letters on the side of it that says Eagles. Joe Walsh had sent me a Roland stereo chorus amplifier and yeah, probably even more valuable than that a shipping container that says Eagles on it and it was a it was a gift from Joe Walsh of the Eagles. You have led, I don't want to say a charmed existence, because it sounds like you didn't have anything to do with it, but that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> My wife uses that expression all the time. is the runway. A sling is attached to a trolley which rides on the cable. The plane is fitted with a hook. It catches the sling, rides down the cable on the trolley, and is braked to a stop. Taking off, the plane is hooked to a different trolley. The motor is revved. The pilot begins his run, gains flight speed, unhooks the plane from the trolley, and takes off. Four masts hold up the runway cable. The runway is suspended at each end by a V-shaped bridle cable. The bridle cables are really prolongations of the runway cable. Each bridle cable runs over a masthead shiv and is anchored to dead men sunk into the ground. Mast, runway cable, bridle cable, masthead shiv, dead men, pair for each bridle cable. Each of the four bridle cables is anchored into the ground by an anchor assembly. The assembly consists of half dozen different parts. Anchor plates, anchor rods, bearing plates, anchor bridle, equalizer shiv, turnbuckles. The anchor rod meets the anchor plate underground and is firmly secured. The anchor rod is connected to the anchor bridle at the bearing plate. The anchor bridle runs over the equalizer shiv. The strain on the bridle cable is adjusted by the turnbuckle. As the anchor assembly actually looks when it is set up. The bridle cables run over the mast, do not support them. Four sets of stays hold each mast upright. The stays are secured by anchor rods locked in anchor plates below ground, just like the dead men shown before. Note turnbuckles. The mast itself is made up of sections of plywood tubing. The sections are coupled together with split steel sleeves. The mast stands on a pivot at the base plate. A 
At each end of the runway cable is a triangular bridle plate. It's at this plate that the runway cable is fastened to the two bridle cables. The sockets of the three cables fit snugly into the bridle plate. The triangular bridle plate also holds the two lifting devices, the davit for the man lift, the derrick for the plane lift. The davit fits into a sleeve pipe which is welded into the center of the bridle plate. The man center lock can easily swing around and reach any part of the apparatus he has to work on. The derrick is bolted onto the triangular bridle plate and to the ends of the bridle cables. Lock and tackle are attached to the derrick and the plane is hoisted up or lowered. The man lift is worked by tackle. The lifting line runs over shivs on the davit and one at the triangular plate. Then through triple eyed fair leads which are clamped along the bridle cable back to a block at the masthead, down to and through a block at the base plate, and out to a snubbing post. The plane lift is also operated by tackle, which runs over another shiv located at the triangular plate, through another eye of the triple eyed fair lead, back to the block at the masthead, and down to a separate single block at the base plate, out to six purchase blocks and attached to a snubbing post. Note the lifting line. The fair lead. The double block. Down the mass of the single block. The landing trolley hangs vertically from a single wheel which runs freely on the runway cable. The landing trolley is shackled to the sling. The sling has three loops. The frame holds the sling out to its full width, six feet. The frame hangs down from the derrick arm. Each of the frame's arms is jointed, is nine feet long. Tabs on the outer loops of the sling are clipped to the arms of the frame. When the plane hooks the sling, the loops are pulled out of the tab. The frame stays put on the derrick arm. The sling itself, shackled to the trolley, is free to run down the cable runway as the slow motion shot shows. What actually stops the plane is an arresting device called the brake drum. Note the brake line at the bottom of the landing trolley. The brake line leads to the drum. The brake drum works on the principle of a giant fishing reel. The plane hooks on, rides the trolley. The arresting brake line resists the momentum of the plane. The brake is applied gradually. The takeoff trolley rolls very smoothly on two wheels. Holding the plane to the takeoff trolley is the takeoff sling. Unlike the three loop landing sling, the takeoff sling is a single four foot nylon rope. In hoisting the plane up, the bottom stirrup of the takeoff sling is locked into the plane hook. The derrick block is hooked into the center ring of the sling. When the plane is pulled up, the free swinging shackle at the top end of the takeoff sling is hooked into the trolley. The derrick block is then slipped out of the center ring and the plane has been transferred from the derrick to the trolley. When the plane has made its run, contact with the takeoff sling is broken by pulling the lanyard in the cockpit. Travel release mechanism 
serves the same purpose as chocks do on a ground runway to keep the plane from starting on its run before the motor is sufficiently revved up. The travel release is a heavy spring. One line holds the plane back. The second line trips the spring. Trip the release and the whole device falls to the ground. When the plane takes off, the takeoff trolley slows down and slides to the end of the runway cable. A spring coiled around the cable stops the trolley, acting as a shock absorber. At the end of the spring is a cone. The cone is not attached to the spring. It is controlled by a slider rope which reaches the ground through the third eye of the triple-eyed fair leads on the bridle cable. This device is used so that the man on the ground can slide the trolley back along the cable for the next takeoff. To go over the takeoff procedure once again, the plane is hooked onto the derrick block and hoisted up to the takeoff trolley. A man is sent aloft to unhook the centre ring off the derrick block and attach the top shackle of the takeoff sling onto the trolley. The travel release holds the plane back while the pilot revs the motor. At a signal from him, the travel release is tripped. The pilot makes his run, gains flight speed, takes off. All the equipment the plane needs is a hook which is bolted onto the fuselage. The takeoff release on the back of the hook has been shown, the finger and the trip. As for the landing, the arm is fastened onto a swivel joint. Running under the length of the arm is a bungee shock absorber, permitting the arm to bend down. The hook itself is fitted into the telescoping tube of the arm. The swivel, the bungee shock absorber, the telescoping mechanism, all three, take up the shock of the impact when the plane hits the landing sling. As the plane hooks on, the catching assembly on the plane swivels back almost to a horizontal position. The bungee shock absorber, as well as the telescoping mechanism, cushion the impact of the landing. Again, in slow motion. A nine-man crew sets out to put up the rigging, this time choosing rough, uncleared terrain, operating as if under field conditions. A five-ton truck brings in the crew and all the necessary equipment. If no roads existed, the equipment and men could be flown in by cargo planes and dropped by parachute. The equipment is sorted and then carried to those points on the field where it will be needed. The site has been surveyed and measured in advance. The runway cable is 500 feet long. The distance between the triangular bridle plate and each mast is 128 feet. The masts are 160 feet apart. The distance from each mast to the anchor assembly is 212 feet. At each end of the runway, on the triangular plate, there is a davit and derrick. 
One mast at either end will hold a double block for the man and plane lift lines. Along the bridle cable, reaching from the bridle plate to this mast, the triple-eyed fair leads will be clamped. The slider rope for the coil spring cone will run through the third eye of these fair leads. The brake drum will be fastened to the second mast at each end. The nylon brake line will run through a single-eyed fair lead clamped on the bridle cable, reaching from the bridle plate to this second mast. The runway cable is unreeled along the path it will follow between the two bridle plates. The bridle cables are unreeled. They meet the runway cable on the ground at the point where they will be fastened onto the bridle plate. The process, of course, is duplicated at the other end of the runway cable. With the cables laid out on the ground, work begins on the mast. Holes are dug for the anchor plates to which the mast stays will be anchored. Anchor plates are sunk into the holes. Anchor rods have been driven in, firmly grip the anchor plate. The mast is inserted into the base plate and secured on a pivot with pins and cotter keys. The mast is built up to its 63 foot length by coupling sections together with split steel sleeve. Note round sections of tubing, an improvement on the hexagonal sections in the mast previously shown. The top of the mast is fitted out before it is raised. The bridle cable is rolled through the masthead shiv. At this time, too, the double block is attached to the top, since this mast is the one used for the man and plane lift. Note I for the double block. The triple-eyed fair leads are loosely clamped on the bridle cable. The lines for the man and plane lift are run through. The slider rope for the coil spring cone will run through the third eye of the fair leads. Stays are attached to the mast, and once that's done, the mast is ready to be hoisted up. A raising boom is used to pull the mast upright. The front stays of the mast are hooked onto the top of the boom. Mast and boom turn on the pivot. With the mast a few feet off the ground, all dangling stays are shackled to their dead men. Guy lines are used to keep the mast steady. The mast is up, the boom down. Now the front stays are taken off the boom and shackled to the dead men. The boom is unfastened, removed. Turn buckles are adjusted to equalize the pull of the stays. In the background, note a second mast already raised. The bridle plate has to be put together now. You may not recognize it on the ground. This is how it looked assembled in the air. The plate is built up. The runway cable and the two bridle. The arms of the derrick are bolted along the bridle cable.
the derrick assembled. Already welded into the center of the bridle plate is a sleeve pipe into which the davit is inserted. A man lift cable runs through shivs. At this time too, before the runway is raised, all other equipment should be assembled. Trolleys, coil spring, slider cone, and the pulley on the bridle plate for the slider rope. Bridle plates are fully assembled at both ends of the runway so that the plane can take off and land in either direction. Before the runway can be raised, the anchor assemblies for the bridle cables have to be hooked up. The two dead men for each anchor assembly have been sunk. Bearing plates are fitted in. Note end of anchor rod. The bridle cable runs through the equalizer shiv to the second bedman. The entire unit is now assembled and lies on the ground. The bridle cables run loosely over the tops of the mast. At one end of the field, the two bridle cables are shackled onto their anchor assemblies before the runway is hoisted up. Therefore, at the other end of the field, the bridle cables will not reach their anchor assemblies until the runway has been raised. Block and tackle are fastened on the bridle cables, beginning the job of raising the runway. Teams work at each side, pulling together on the two bridle cables so that each of them shares the load. When the runway is a few feet off the ground, the lift lines running through the fair leads are checked. The turnbuckle is shackled onto the bridle cable. Tension is adjusted by the turnbuckles. Step for step, the process has been duplicated with the second bridle cable. Both bridle cables are now anchored. The runway is up. Welcome to 2012 Warbirds in Review, and today we're, this is the 75th anniversary of the Cub, and what we have here is we have a veteran of World War II, and Paul here is going to be talking to us a little bit about what he did in World War II with the, with the uh, L-4. We have the J-3 over here, and we also have an, an, the L-4 and the N-1. So... Uh, what we'll do is uh, introduce all three of these gentlemen. The fourth one didn't show up. This aircraft owners will tell you a little bit about their specific airplanes, and then we'll. Most of the show is going to be for our hero here, Paul, and he'll be telling us about his World War II experiences. 
The other thing that I have here is we have four DVDs in there that you might be interested in. One is it's in their own words, and uh, it's Bud Anderson, Robin Olds, who has passed away, Bob Hoover, McGovern, Shorty Rankin, Gunther Rawl, who has passed, Hal Weekly, who has passed, and also Tex Hill. Uh, they, we also have the series of uh, events that changed the war. Uh, the, uh, that's there in there. That's the Doolittle Raid, uh, Gunther Rawl, uh, Tex Hill, and uh, then there's a conglomerate of other pilots also. So you might want to go in there and look at those because they were, they were all on the military channel, and uh, they're very well worth it. It's four hours of, of each one of them. So anyway, that being said... Let's talk about the Cub. But it was designed by C.J. Taylor. It was produced from 1937 to 1947. There were over 20,000 built, just slightly over. There was a J3C, which had a Continental, a JC3F, which was Franklin, J3L, Lycoming, and a J3P, Lanyop three cylinder. And I saw one of those down on the line the other day. So they're, and I think they're, they're very rare. And the J-3 was a primary trainer with the CPTP program in World War II, prior to World War II. A lot of the pilots, 80% of the pilots, were trained in the Cub before they went into pilot training. So it was very, very important as far as the Second World War. What they would do is in the, C in the civilian pilot training program is the, the guys that were going to go into aviation cadets, they would go into the CPTP program and it, they flew in the Cub, and if they didn't have the ability to fly an airplane, then they, they, they did something else. But anyway, it was a selection process. The L-4 here is over by Harold Cannon. This is Harold here. The any one is Jim Rizik. Rizik. Well, that was, it was close. And uh, we'll let, let them tell you a little bit about their particular airplane when we get, get on with the cruise. The, the top speed on the J3 is 85, cruise speed 75, service ceiling is 12,000 feet, stall is 38, uh, plus or minus, three hours, 225 miles. There were 5,413 L4s produced, including 250 NE1s and 2s. Paraguay used them, South Korea. United Kingdom and the United States. They were used primarily as spotters. Sometimes they used them, they had bazookas on them. And uh, we'll let Paul talk, tell us a little bit about that. I think that they used them actually to uh, fire on the tanks that were behind the hedgerows. Now, Paul Harrington here, the pilot, is Paul went to Purdue in 1940, 1940s, an ROTC. February of 43, he joined the Army Reserves. He was active duty in two weeks after he did that. Stayed in school in eight, April of 43. He elected to go to OCS. Pilot class is 43L, is that correct, sir? Flew L2s, L3s, and L4s. And L4s, that, that's the only airplane he flew up until VE Day. Now, let me, would you tell us a little bit about your particular airplane, Harold, before we get into the uh, discussion here with Paul? Okay. Hi. My L-4 actually never left the United States. It was in Fort Sill. Uh, it was restored a couple of times before it came to us. The last restoration, it was made into a replica of Janie, which was uh, flown by Dutch Schultz, who wrote a book called Little Airplane, Big War. And uh, Dutch was a pretty famous as L4 drivers go. A lot of you may already know who he is. He got uh, credit for an ME109 kill by avoiding being shot down by pulling up and the ME109 didn't make the turn, hit the ground. He also flew this guy around named Patton. And uh, uh, it turns out that Dutch was a horseman and Patton was a, an equestrian enthusiast and he was uh, taking him somewhere and they met nightfall, spent the night under the wing talking about horses and uh, Captain Schultz flew Patton around a lot after that. Um, I came to own this airplane about six years ago under a tree in the Elbert area right here. My daughter is named Piper and she's out here. And so I thought we would eventually have a cub for her. 
and it had to be green. So that's how we got Janie. And owning it's been a pleasure. It's a ton of fun to fly. Takes a little while to get somewhere. Um, I've been fortunate enough to fly warbirds up here for several years, and uh, three years ago I was here in an L-39. I have uh, T-34s. I was here in a T-34 last year, and I live in Kentucky. And so the travel time in the L-39 is an hour 20. In the uh, T-34, it's about 2.40. In the Cub, it was eight and a half hours in the saddle and 13 hours on the clock, and my rear is still numb. But it was fun. And I want to tell you, nobody waves at you when you go by an L-39. Go ahead, Jim. Our airplane is a true warbird. Uh, this Piper Any One was built in uh, November of 19 or uh, April of 1942 and delivered to the Navy um, in June 3rd of 1942 at the Naval Air uh, Reserve Base in Detroit, which is Gross Isle. Uh, the airplane stayed there for uh, just over a month and then was transferred to the newly built and commissioned um, Naval Air Station Bunker Hill, Indiana. Uh, Bunker Hill was uh, affectionately called the USS Cornfield by the Navy pilots there. Uh, the best we can research, uh, our airplane was part of a contract of 250 airplanes that Piper was commissioned to build for the Navy. Uh, these were straight J3s, Continental powered. They had three options is all. They had battery operated navigation lights, Rupert seat belts, and the chrome yellow paint instead of the normal J3 uh, paint on them. Uh, we were pretty fortunate to run across a copy of a book from a 16 millimeter film that introduces the NE-1 to the Navy training cadet. And it's basically a how to fly a J3 type thing that they put together. And we took a lot of our markings from that book and from other resources that we were able to find. Uh, the airplane stayed at Bunker Hill most all of its Navy career. Uh, it looks like it went to Jacksonville for a short time, probably for uh, a major repair or major recovery, and then came back. And probably one of the most uh, significant things about Bunker Hill was one of the uh, cadets that was in school there was Major League Baseball star Ted Williams. And it's documented on Ted Williams' website that he had over 100 hours of any one time. So there, there is a remote possibility that they, he could have flown our airplane. I have not been able to find records from the Navy uh, to k tell us what uh, squadron it might have been assigned to or what flying school it was assigned to at the time. Uh, the airplane uh, got mustered out uh, in December of 1945. as bought by a gentleman in Gary, Indiana and licensed as a civilian airplane then. It was in service until 1971 when it had an accident that uh, pretty much totaled the airplane and it went into hibernation until 2007 when my partner Rick Kluver found the airplane and began the restoration. Uh, the restoration is pretty authentic. Uh, the only thing that's really missing, the airplane would have had a three-piece windshield when it initially left the factory. Uh, ours, ours has got the single piece. Uh, we've made some safety concerns. We've put Cleveland uh, wheels and brakes on it. We've put an electric starter on it to make it a little bit more friendly to operate uh, around uh, paved airports and so forth. Uh, I was fortunate to get involved with Rick to help him with the restoration. This is the second one I've done. I uh, was fortunate to learn to fly in a J3 and sold it on my 16th birthday. Ended up restoring that airplane and have somewhere between 900 and 1,000 hours of J3 time. Thank you. Mike, uh, we, this is Mike Porter over here, and this is his airplane, the J3C over here because it's a Continental. Would you uh, give us a little brief history on your airplane? Alrighty, uh, this particular J3 was built in uh, April of uh, 1940, uh, as it originally came out with a uh, Franklin 50 horse on it, and in 1943 the airplane was brought back to Piper, and they uh, put a 65 horse Continental on it, brakes, and got rid of the tail skid and put a tail wheel on it. Uh, it's a stock airplane that went through the whole war, uh, I'm assuming with either CPT program or with the Navy in the New Jersey metro area. That's where it spent its entire time. Uh, in fact, the airplane never has really left that New York metro area until we own the airplane. Uh, this is actually the farthest west this airplane has ever been in its life today. All right. Thank you very much. All right, Paul, let's get down to uh, what, what all these people are here 
they want to hear hear your stories World War Two. Start off how how did how were you selected to be in the a liaison pilot? Well, when I uh, as I graduated from OCS, I just signed up to pilot school and I was immediately put in it. I guess they needed them pretty bad. Well, I, you were the whole program. You knew when you first entered pilot training that you were going to be a liaison pilot. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, when you graduated, uh, you shipped them immediately overseas, or did you you stayed there for a while in the states? Well, uh, first, uh, uh, I went to Denton for my basic training, and then went to Fort Sill for my advanced flight training. I graduated from there in January of. Uh, 44, and uh, uh, was assigned to the 76th Division here at Camp McCoy, and uh, uh, we were only there about a week, and they issued us uh, skis, and we went to the northern peninsula of Michigan for winter maneuvers. Uh, that was my first experience, anyway. Well, I, uh, now... After you were shipped overseas and uh, you went over on the Queen Mary, is that correct? That, no, the Queen Elizabeth. I mean, Queen Elizabeth, Queen yeah. Mary. Well, they didn't, they didn't even thought about that yet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, tell us, pick pick that up after you got over to, to England and on the Queen Mary and and uh, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, Queen Elizabeth, excuse yeah. me. I keep. I wish I, was, I always wanted to go on the Queen Mary. Well, the the QE was supposed to be the largest one afloat at the time. And uh, they had a crew, wartime crew of 10,000, and uh, we ca carried 25,000 troops on the ship. So that made 35,000 on that ship, and uh, it took us four days to go from New York to the Firth of Clyde in Scotland. Okay, after you got to Scotland, what what happened then? Well, you know, that's I left. I left the. St I mean, I left Camp McCoy to, to, in the pipeline of replacement in uh, July of 44, and I finally got to my unit in October of 44. That's how long it took to go through all the repel devils that they had. Well, did they give, did you have any training as to when you got over there as to what your mission was supposed to be, as what a typical mission, did you get to fly with somebody else to, to see what you were supposed to oh, do, or did they just tell you go out there and do it? go out there and do it. That's the kind of the way. I was never checked out in any plane except the L2, 3, and 4 at the beginning of flight school. After that, it was just go and fly it. Well, just walk us through us a typical mission that you flew. Well, uh, we had uh, our observers were forward observers, and uh, the colonel uh, let four observers be air observers so they could draw flight pay if they wanted to. And they'd fly with us for two weeks and then be in a tank for two weeks as a forward observer. So uh, not all of them wanted to fly with us. They, uh, but the ones that did were really pretty good at it. And uh, uh, they, on adjusting fire, as I was telling somebody a while ago, uh, the enemy really wouldn't fire on us. Uh, the planes would, but not the ground fire, because we could immediately bring artillery on them. So I would try to keep the target between me and the guns so that I didn't get involved in our own uh, artillery fire, because that was more dangerous to be, be put shot down by your own artillery than it would be to, to uh, be shot down by somebody else. What altitude did you fly? Were you just skimming the trees when you were going over there or 300 feet? So what would you go? Well, you, you flew as high as you could needed to to see what you wanted to see. Otherwise, you, you stayed fairly low. Uh, I'd say never got over 2,000 feet. And mostly, uh, well, it was like our song was over trees, under wires, to hell with landing gear and tires. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you had in your m memoirs there that I was reading that there was an instance that 
you wish that you had had skis, that you didn't have skis on the airplane. Could you give us that? Oh, yeah, that was in December of, of uh, 44. Uh, it was one of the worst winters that they had ever had. And, uh, uh, of course, we didn't have any skis there, which would have been very nice, but uh, would have avoided me having one one less wreck anyway if, I, if I'd have had skis on the plane, maybe. But were you uh, were you on a mission at that time, particular time when you? Well, uh, no, we were just uh, changing from one location to another. Uh, we were we were going from a, a, a town in Germany to one in Belgium. Well, how many total missions did you fly before the end of the war? One hundred and thirty-five. One thirty-five days. Did, did yeah. you do more than one mission a day? Oh yeah. Uh, the, on the, the, as I say, it was my only claim to fame would be on the, uh, December seventeenth in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, the weather we couldn't fly on the sixteenth. The weather was too bad. We didn't fly on the eighteenth because the weather was too bad. On the 17th, we decided we could fly. After all, just the other pilot and I, we could make our own decisions about when we flew and when we didn't. And uh, and our colonel wanted a plane in the air at all times that was possible. So uh, we flew that day. Uh, the wind was so strong that the ground crew had to catch the wings when we came in to land to hold the plane down. And. Uh, uh, I flew the most hours I've ever flown that day, and uh, we fired our own battalion, we fired the 78th Division, and we fired Corps Artillery, and we fired Army Artillery, which were the 240s. Uh, we had, uh, uh, we caught a uh, armored column of, of Panzer tanks in a defilated woods area, and uh, my observer uh, disabled the lead tank and disabled the rear tank and then told them to fire in between. That was all with 240s. And they really, uh, uh, you know, every once in a while they'd throw in a smoke ground just so that uh, they could burn up everybody. Well, what kind of armor did the uh, backseater have back there? Oh, well, our, our unit was, uh, uh, we had M7s, which are sometimes called the priest, and it was a 105 uh, howitzer on it. Uh, and we had six, six guns per, uh, per a battery, uh, rather than four like is in standard ones. And we also had three tanks for the forward observers, one for each battery. Well, you mentioned in, the, in, in your memoirs there about the uh, one time when the German paratroops were dropped in on. Oh, yeah. That was, Would you uh, tell that story, please? That was probably about the 14th of December. And uh, when we weren't flying on the, on the 16th, I went out with some guys and we picked up the supply chutes that they had also dropped uh, so that they wouldn't have any supplies. But they, they were dressed in uh, American uniforms when they were dropped. Oh, this, this, that was in that movie, I guess, The Battle of Bulls, about yeah, the, that. Yeah. So that it was just one. They were all dressed as American uniforms then. Mm -hmm. Did they capture most of them? I think so. Well, now this, you say this was on the 18th, and the 17th was the day that you, you flew. That was the high point of your... I guess you're high point of your career there. Yeah. Except uh, drinking with the Russians, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> That's pretty uh, good too. Well, <laughs> tell it. Tell us about the time that the ME 109 got after you. Oh well, that was one where they said that uh, there were 11 ME 109s, and I said, "Oh no, it couldn't be. I've never seen that many in one place at a time." But I was wrong. <laughs> And one of them took after me, but I kept uh, circling and losing altitude inside of his turning, and so I could turn a lot shorter. 
certainly. And when I uh, got down on the trees, why he just made one pass and took off. And I got a couple of. That's the nice thing about the the fabric cover; it doesn't explode any shells. But it gets your pucker factor up, I guess, when he's back there. Yeah, yeah, all the time. yeah it does. Yeah, it makes you a little excited. All right, now, you, after you ended up in Czechoslovakia, would you describe your encounter with the Russians there? Oh. Well, uh, there were several, but uh, well, one good one, we went over there to meet some of their officers and they had a few drinks with them, and, and it was a real party. And then coming back, though, uh, uh, the guard didn't want to let us cross the border. And uh, so we made a few comments and went across anyway, and he fired at us, but that was all right. Missed. Well, you mentioned also in, in, that, that the Russians had taken up one position that they weren't supposed to. Oh, yeah, well, that isn't in the colonel's uh, book that he wrote, uh, that he had either of his. Uh, uh, by the way, my, I had a good commander. He became a four-star general, so uh, there was no question about his ability to lead. But he, he didn't include this incident. The Russians came over and, opera and occupied a town on our side. And uh, so he took the 18 M7s, circled it, and the three tanks, and circled the town. And he went in and told, he said, if you are not gone by daybreak, I'm going to level this town. Well, the bluff worked because uh, they pulled out. Of course, I guess that was probably their, their policy at the time, get as much as you can, I guess. Yeah. Well, initially, when you first met the Russians, they were pretty friendly, though, weren't they? When the first yeah. encounter with them? Yeah. Uh, not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, how about after the war? Uh, after we, uh, you were oh, in the that, occupation forces for a while over there. Yeah. Uh, that, I had some interesting experiences there because uh, the first assignment I had, but you have to know that the Third Army Air Officer and I were uh, students together in pilot school, although he was a captain at the time, and I was a second lieutenant. Uh, so after the war ended, I did, uh, didn't have anything to do, and so I went down and said, well, what do you got for me to do? And he said, well, how about flying the mail out of Pilsen? So I said, well, that's pretty good. So uh, we did that as long as uh, we occupied Czechoslovakia, but when we pulled out of there, I said, "Well, what are you going? What you got for me now?" And he said, "Well, do you want to ferry planes?" And so I did that from a, a small town there in southern uh, Germany. But uh, uh, we ferried planes from there to to Frankfurt. There were planes that had been turned in. There was L ones, L. Fours, uh, L5s. Uh, we used a C64 for the pickup plane, and uh, that was interesting. One thing I didn't ask you, and I meant to ask you when we were talking about World War II, is what was the casualty rate with the liaison pilots? Well, uh, our two pilots uh, that were there before me were staff sergeant pilots, and uh, they were both shot down the same day. Uh, one was a crash and burn, and the other one survived. And uh, uh, they promoted him to second lieutenant and decided to send him back to Fort Sill to take the officer's basic course. And when he got back to Sill, they put him in the flying school and had him teaching tactics, so that was his uh, thing. But uh, I don't know. You don't think about those things or you don't want to think about them. But in your office, was there only, how many pilots did you have in your, right there with you? Just, two. just the two of you? Yeah. So you pretty much, between the two of you, decided what you were going to do. Is that 
correct? I mean, the colonel told you obviously that. Yeah, he he, he wanted to he wanted to keep a player in the air at all times for to observe targets. If we were on the march, he wanted a plane flying point. Well, that's kind of tough to keep airplane up all the time when there's only two guys. Did yeah. uh, did the did the guys in the back fly at all? Did you did you let them fly at all? No. So no. They, so they were just, they were just there for observers, and you, yeah. you had a what a twenty five pound radio in the back end. You were overgrossed to start off with, weren't you? Uh, and you wore backpack parachutes instead of uh, the seat pack. But well, was there? How about ground fire from small arms fire? Was is that was that a much of a hazard? About what? <clears throat> the small arms fire from the ground. Was oh, that? once in a while uh, there would be. Uh, I know one time I, I uh, had been flying up above the clouds and I found a uh, break in the overcast and went down through it and came up along a valley. And they had machine guns on both sides. That wasn't too hot. But, uh, all I did was get a couple of holes in the tail surface that was on. Well, that'd be exciting, though. <laughs> Not very. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks. Anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Just a second. Just a second. Let me bring you a mic. Is this hot? Okay, Mike, could you give us a couple of words about you one served at Navy Lakehurst in support of the fleet, the airships? All righty. Well, the uh, Navy uh, out of uh, Lakehurst had Airship Squadron Number 12, and they were in charge of the entire Atlantic for patrolling for submarines and any enemy uh, shipment movements in the uh, entire Atlantic. And what they took and did close to the shoreline, they uh, employed a... a any ones, J3 Cub, uh, to fill in holes in their, uh, where they had the airships running uh, close to shore. Uh, they're very similar in speed, so that's where the Navy came up with the idea of saying we've got a good cheap airplane we can use close to shore to fill in the little holes that they knew they had. Um, one of the last recorded ships that was actually uh, sunk in the Battle of the Atlantic was a submarine off the coast of Long Island and an any one and one of the blimps out of Lakehurst were what spotted it. When you were visiting the Russians, you were trying to get back into the border, but the guard wouldn't let you. How, how were you uh, able to get by them? How'd you get by oh, them? we just took off. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't use the phrase that we used in Russian either kind of fields were you flying out of in um, the Battle of the Bulge? What sort of strips were you using? Oh, it was just, this was uh, just a, a uh, little grass strip on a, on a little farm there. Uh, we had to get the uh, farmer to hook up to a little wooden plow he had and plow us a place where we could take off. So there was one that you didn't mention about, you know, the, and people were asked about the wartime uh, role of this plane and, and uh, uh, the Battle of the Bulge. I know that your commander had said that you guys or your battalion fired over 300 pieces of artillery that day. Uh, because 78th had grounded their airplanes and the other division air officers had grounded their airplanes. And it's been a very important tool for, uh, for the U.S. and the Allies in winning that war. But well, the question I had wanted to ask about was that when you were at, you know, you, you, told, you told us as kids that you were in winter maneuvers in 30 below living in a tent. And we thought this was like all winter or something, but apparently it was only like for a week or two. And when your buddies yeah. got you to go over to a hotel, which was the King's Cross Oh, yeah, hotel. I forgot that. <laughs> and, and if you've been to the King's Cross, uh, it's a, in northern Wisconsin here, 
And there was a reason why, after a while, the brass wouldn't fly with you? I, oh, probably because uh, uh, we tried to fly down the ski jump. <laughs> <laughs> I was successful on touching the skis down once. We also uh, went in the bar there, and, and we had some parachutes that needed to be repacked, so we jumped off the bar and yelled Geronimo and pulled the ripcord and let the parachutes go all over. We want to thank all of you for coming today, and uh, it's nice to have everybody here uh, for the Warbirds in Review. As you know, we're here twice a day for the rest of the week. We're at 10 in the morning, 1 in the afternoon. And uh, uh, we're going to have Bob Hoover is going to be here tomorrow. Uh, we've got the, the Doodle Raiders. Uh, we've got uh, Corsair. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff coming up. So be sure and look at our billboard out there. And it just so happens the billboards are by the donation. So uh, think about us. And it, as I said before, in the EA Warbirds, we've got the DVDs for sale over there, and which are really good, by the way. And that, that's that's. Kyle is the one that did everything right there. Yeah. And, oh, and also, uh, Harold mentioned something here. Uh, we could use your support by joining Warbirds of America. You know, uh, there's only a small percentage of the members of the Warbirds that actually own a Warbird. We're all just supporters of the Warbirds of America. And so if you feel like joining, we've got an excellent magazine. And if you join, you come around here, we'll make a point to make you welcome. Thanks again, folks.